With ever-shrinking deadlines and budgets, a lot of developers often have to cut corners with their games, usually removing multiple features to meet such requirements. However, sometimes these companies get so chop-happy with their revisions, be it for time or budgetary reasons, that you sometimes get little more than a glorified demo. For example, Sonic 3 & Knuckles is probably the most famous game to be cut in half, so I obviously won't be including that. But at least you got both halves eventually. A lot of today's entries never even had that luxury. You were literally conned out of 50% of what you paid for. Sometimes even more. So this episode, we take a look at these severed softwares, these digitally divided, and these perforated programs. As I say, but hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five games you never knew were cut in half. Capcom were quite the inventive ones during the seventh generation of consoles, creating multiple new IPs. Some successful, such as Dead Rising, some being a bit, well, meh, like Lost Planet, and some, like Dark Void, falling completely on their ass. And then there was Azura's Wrath. Now, Azura's Wrath has been described as an interactive anime, which sounds cool on paper, but it's more an endless procession of cutscenes, quick time events, and a smidgen of God of War plagiarism to actually qualify it as a game. But if you like the concept of an angry, shouty man who goes around punching gods, then you'll love the concept. Like an anime series, Azura's Wrath is broken up into multiple episodes. However, by the time players beat the game, some stories, such as defeating the evil force at the centre of the earth, were resolved. But other plots, such as the mystery of the Golden Spider, still remained unanswered. So, with such an anticlimactic ending, some speculated it was a possible setup for a sequel. But just two months later, Capcom announced no. For just the low, low price of just $6.99, you'll be able to purchase the remaining four episodes of the game, finally wrapping up all those loose ends. Gamers were not happy. Even more so after data miners looked into the game's code and, yup, the ending was meant to be there originally. Towards the end of development, Capcom decided to cut the final third of the game from the disc and sell it as DLC a few months later. Why would they do this? To fleece their user base? Well, yes. But ultimately, it was perceived as a rather egregious attempt by Capcom of combating the used game market, such as EA had done with Project $10. However, unlike Project $10, there was no free DLC codes in new copies of the game, so it affected players whether you acquired your copy new or used. Capcom managing to be even scummier than Electronic Arts? Yep, it's rare, but it does happen. The mid to late 90s were really the boom time for nostalgia with old video games, especially arcade machines. The huge success Namco had with their Namco Museum series on PS1 blew open the floodgates of publishers rubbing their hands at making a quick buck from recycling old software. And no one was guiltier of this than DSi Games who quickly went around snapping up the rights to multiple Atari and Midway titles and porting them to the Game Boy Advance. Unfortunately, DSi assumed that, as the games already existed, it would be a cinch to port them, so gave Italian developers Frame Studios the Herculean task of porting Rampage and Paperboy and this entry's title, the blatantly disappointing Tetris bandwagon jumping puzzler Clax and Mark Cerny's seminal isometric ball fondler, 
Marble Madness in just two months. That's two weeks per game. Now, what happened with Clax is bad enough. They only managed to insert the first three levels before looping ad nauseum. Cheap, but not too noticeable on a puzzle game. However, what happened with Marble Madness is where the rush development really began to show. First of all, multiple enemies and features are totally missing, such as a bully marble in level 2 and the wave machine at the end of the third section. And speaking of the third section, that's it. Once you've finished it, it's literally game over. Back to the title screen. Marble Madness was a short enough game sporting only seven rounds, but to give you half a game was little more than what you got in a demo. In all fairness, Frame Studios were intending to release the game complete. Looking into the game's code, there's placeholders for the missing rounds titles. But for DSi to only give the poor sods two weeks to port a legendary arcade game and then happily publish it with no mention that half the game was missing is totally inexcusable. While there's been many an article about Sega's exploits during their 8-bit generation, one thing that's never brought up was their bizarre tendency to cut several of their games in half for Western releases. And none were more prevalent than the home ports of arcade games Enduro Racer and Captain Silver. Enduro Racer was an early release on the Master System. An isometric adaptation of their largely forgotten arcade game where you leap over various ramps while avoiding obstacles, other bikers and Grasshopper from Twisted Metal who is constantly trying to cut you up. It was great for its time and the fact the tracks repeat after the halfway mark was pretty much a given for games back then. No one thought any differently. However, come the dawn of the internet with ROMs and emulators becoming easily available, there was some surprise that there was a version of the game with extra levels right from the outset. Where did this come from? Was it a beta release or something? No, it was the Japanese original. Yup, as a shock to all, 50% of the game had been removed from the international release of Enduro Racer in order to fit a 256k game into a 128k cartridge. And aside from removing levels 1, 3, 7, 9 and 10, Sega also removed the course progression screen from the end of the game, which makes sense in hindsight considering 50% of the map no longer exists in the game, as well as the artwork on the game's title screen. In fact, the only positive thing the Western version has over the Japanese original is they fixed a game-breaking glitch where you could complete the entire game by simply keeping your bike in the farthest left section of the screen. Surprisingly, this wasn't the only time Sega were caught cutting games in half. Just one year later, service games were at it again with their port of arcade platformer Captain Silver. Captain Silver sees you in the scurvatious pantaloons of James Avery, a young lad on a quest to find the legendary treasure of the namesake Captain Silver, whom, armed with only a cutlass, must thwart cats, witches, furry cosplayers, the Pied Piper of Hamlin, and basically anything else that's got bugger all to do with pirates. Both the arcade original and Master System port were brutally difficult. One of those one-hit death, back to the beginning of the round jobbies. So trimming the game down to a cartridge half its original size again may be considered some kind of mercy. So out went two of the already paltry six levels to four, removing the sailboat and cavern levels, deleting a number of enemies, bosses, and then devolving the ending screen to some scrolling text just for good measure. However, Bizarrely, this time Sega only ever did this to the US release of the game. The European version remained fully intact. So why only America? Unfortunately, there's no definitive answer here. Assumingly, Sega of America didn't have much confidence in residents of the land of the rising apple pie in purchasing Caribbean sea plunderer themed platform games based on arcade games no one remembers so save themselves a few bucks clawing back anticipated low levels of sales. 
so any collectors out there who want the complete game, keep an eye out for the version with a more cartoony looking box art here. Long before the gaming world was obsessed with the dumpster fire development of the dystopian cyberpunk, uh, cyberpunk 2077, they were obsessed with the dumpster fire development of the dystopian cyberpunk Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Starring its very own impromptu Keanu Reeves in the guise of the wheezy voiced Adam Jensen, Mankind Divided was a sequel to the highly successful Human Revolution receiving a princely 2.18 million sales. So with numbers like that, a follow-up was inevitable. However, development wasn't so clean sailing with the sequel, not with the game itself per se, but surprisingly, its story. Several of the voice actors, including Adam Jensen's VA himself, Elias Tufexis, had taken umbrage with the plot's direction. So it was decided to scrap the majority of what had been narrated and start over. Quite a brave decision from the devs, especially considering the game was already several years into its development, not to mention being delayed six months past its initial release date and publishers Square Enix breathing down the team's neck to get something out. But ultimately, the team concluded that it was best to wrap things up with the game giving it a cut-off point in the story and simply release the remaining half of the game as and when it was completed as a sequel. Unfortunately, while being a rather decent game and even receiving double the sales its prequel did, Square Enix was in the middle of their bizarre, if it doesn't shift more than 5 million copies, it's a failure tangent and promptly cancelled development of the remaining half slash sequel. Now, officially, the game has never been cancelled, cancelled. But considering it's been over five years since we heard a peep about the game's developments, we can pretty much assume, yes, yes it has. So, in their infinite wisdom, Squeenix decided to retire the Deus Ex franchise for a while in favour of more successful IPs, such as Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Marvel Avengers. So, that worked out well for them, didn't it? Our next entry is less a game cut in half, but more one actually cut into thirds. Whatever way you look at it, the sixth entry into the popular Metal Gear Solid series was an absolute dumpster fire. Heavily delayed yet blatantly rushed at the same time, with the director Hideo Kojima going full diva during development, such as becoming salty towards Snake's voice actor David Hayter's popularity in the West and booting him off the project, cameoing and crediting himself in the game every five minutes, and most hilarious of all, getting all creepy towards the Dutch model Stephanie Joosten, fawning over her everywhere and shoving her in the game half naked as quiet, which ultimately only got him friend zoned. <laughs> So all this nonsense going on behind the curtains and a heavily delayed game spiralling out of financial control, Kojima mutually agreed to leave Konami. Anyhow, when Konami took over, the game was a broken mess. Not that we knew that at the time, but you could tell that there was cracks in the wall when Konami decided to cut out the intro level to Metal Gear Solid 5 and release it as an almost full price title to both appease patient fans and help with the vastly overblown budget the game had amassed over its multiple missed deadlines as Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes. Yeah, they kinda did this before the oil tank level in Metal Gear Solid 2, but at least they gave that one away for free. Well, with a copy of Zone the Enders anyway. But gamers would have to endure another year and a half before they were finally subjected to the rest of the title, with Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain. The title's irony duly noted. The first half of the game is admittedly pretty impressive. You could tell what the game was going to be, as well as the build up to the second half. 
However, it's when you hit that 50% completion mark, you notice the entire game starting to completely collapse. For instance, the whole subplot of you building your own metal gear from parts scavenged throughout the game, assumingly for some kind of epic battle at the game's climax, totally abandoned, never to be mentioned again. In fact, every single mission in the second half of the game is literally a repeat of the ones from the first, whether they make relevance to the plot or not. Data miners rifling through the PC version of the game discovered remnants for a third chapter not present in the final release, titled Peace, as well as multiple unused gameplay features and audio files. Many of these were concepts that were incomplete, or just abandoned because of the conflicts between Kojima and Konami, such as cutscenes for a final boss fight within the game. As with other titles like Driver 3, Konami simply ran out of time and money to develop the game, so they slapped a couple of band-aids on what was complete and released the game as is, hoping for the best. However, unlike Driver 3 and quite clearly being an unfinished game, the press lorded over it, with sites such as GameSpot and IGN awarding the game a perfect 10 out of 10. And even infamously scoring Skinflint's Famitsu gave it top marks with 40 out of 40. Misleading, all the journos never got to the second half of the game. You decide. But whichever way you look at it, an incomplete game should never receive a perfect score. So, what happened after? Well, Konami would go on to stitch Ground Zeroes and the Phantom Pain back together, releasing it as Metal Gear Solid V, the definitive experience, a year later. And Hideo Kojima would start his own development studio, modestly named Kojima Productions, where he would go on to create seminal Daryl Dixon lugging around a fetus in a jar walking simulator, Death Stranding which will receive generally favourable scores of 8 out of 10 by anyone who could understand what the hell was going on in it. But whatever way you look at it, as both a highly anticipated game and the epitaph to the Metal Gear Solid franchise, well unless you count the bloody awful Metal Gear Survive, it was a bittersweet way to end the franchise. Will we ever see another entry to wrap up all those loose ends? One can only hope. Viewers also might like to know there's a Fact Hunt book to accompany the series. Hello you! Thanks ever so much for watching! Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon! But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time! Tara for now.